Welcome back. Uh, our next speaker, uh, our, let, me, let me change that. Our previous speaker was from MasterCard, who is a member, the organization is a member of the Serious Strategic Partnership Program for less than a year. And we have a lot going on with them. Uh, and we're excited about that opportunity and what a great talk and we're happy to hear. On the other end of the spectrum, who we are also very happy is here, but the relationship with Sirius goes back more than 20 years, and you know we're now celebrating our 21st year. So our speaker now is from Lockheed Martin, Mr. Uh, Rob Hale, or is it Dr. Rob yeah, Hale? Not yet. Okay, not yet, okay. December. So Rob Hale, who is a Lockheed Martin Fellow with Cybersecurity, and we're pleased that you're here. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Um, okay, so I put this on myself, so I don't know if this is gonna work right or not since I've already screwed up passing my slides already once today. Um, I was actually going to ask how many people out here own an F-35 um, and get, you know, give them one. But uh, we really couldn't after the thing in Japan here recently. Um, that's, a, that's a joke that all my business development people are going to hate. Um, I've titled this, this presentation about 20 different titles um, because I really couldn't come up with the way I wanted to say it. And I was watching... Um, Watching TED Talks, I like TED Talks, um, on various and sundry things, and there was uh, one that was talking about clarity versus um, mystery and, you know, things like that, um, and trying to, try to do something that's going to really, you know, cause a lasting memorable impression in ways other than ways that I've created lasting memorable impressions in the past. <laughs> and um, it talked about the importance of a title, and I figure I screwed that up at the front, so the rest of the presentation is going to go really well. I titled it Defense in the 21st Century in the 21st iteration of this um, because it really is, that, that's what we do at Lockheed. We're a global security company. Um, it's no surprise to anyone we make airplanes, that uh, uh, everything from cargo planes to weapons platforms. We make missile defense systems. We make a lot of things that are not necessarily um, defense related from that standpoint. We make, uh, uh, we, we do a lot of work in the energy community and associated communities, but our predominant business is in the global security industry. And one of the biggest challenges that we have today is really in this, how do we bring all of this data? We do not lack for data. How do we bring this together and how do we actually provide a meaningful defense as we go forward given our adversaries today? Now I will tell you right now, I am not an expert in, in artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks, or any of the associated practices thereof. Um, I just have a lot of experience in building secure architectures. I don't work with our IT security department. We have an entirely great group of people that do that and keep us very, very secure. Um, they do a fantastic job, and I don't work with them. I do advanced research and development in trying to secure our weapons platforms and also the interconnection of those platforms and systems as we go forward. So what I'm going to give you is, or what I want to talk about today is really what are the challenges that we're facing, what are some of the things we're doing, and just kind of leave some open questions with you to be thinking about and to be looking at, because these are the things that we're, that we're dealing with. I love the, oh, let's try the right button. There we go. Um, I started with Albert Einstein's picture because I loved his quote, or the quote that's at least attributed to him. If you go to Snopes, there's all sorts of questions as to whether or not it was him. Um, but where he was talking about, I don't know what weapons World War III will be fought with, but the war after that one will be fought with sticks and stones. Um, of course, this was after World War II where he had the atomic bomb. He had all of this work that he was doing with that. And he was really talking about the fact that really the technological advantages, or at least the way I interpret it, the technological advantages are such that it's changing so much that we're going to have something so devastating, or it could be so devastating, that after that there's, there's nothing, uh, nothing else. I would like to kind of posit that while it may not be the weapon that is used in the next war, the information is going to be the enabler of the weapon systems of the future, and the weapon systems, frankly, of today. Um, so, okay, there we go. So the first question and that we deal with is, should we be doing this? Now, I'm going to punt on this. I'll tell you that right up front, because there's a lot of ethical concerns and questions in here, and very viable ones that need to be talked about across all the communities. Uh, there's legal ramifications. There's ethical uh, ramifications. Doing research and development, the way I look at this question, the way I, the way I ask or the way I answer it is really this. Is somebody else going to do it? The fact of the matter is, technology has always been abused. You go all the way back to uh, the first guy that used a spear. The first guy who used a spear goes, you know, I can use this to hunt elk. 
or the, that deer and goes out. You got a second guy, maybe not as fast, goes, I'm not as fast enough to catch that deer, but I can sure enough use it to catch the guy that caught the deer. So you have an abuse of the first, the first thing that's used as far as technology is going. We have the same thing today. We have a lot of really good technology that gets abused. We will continue to have technology that gets abused. That is always going to happen. And if it's something that we ignore or something that we, that we refuse to look at because of, the, because of the concerns and the ethical considerations, I'm not saying that we should punt on those. I'm just saying that from an R&D perspective, we should not turn away from those and use that as a, as, a, as a system of saying we just shouldn't address this. If we refuse to address it, it will be addressed by someone for us, and we probably will not like their result. So that's my, my soapbox for that. Going to that, I really get to the point of intelligent machines, because that's what we're starting to talk, to talk about. How do we get to a point where we've got all of these things connected together, getting the information that they need? And I'll go into a little bit about how Lockheed's addressing it getting the information that they need. How do we go about and manage this? How intelligent will machines get? There's a lot of different schools of thought on this, by the way. You have the Ray Kurzweil school that talks about you know, the idea of being able to map the human brain and you can upload your consciousness and everything and then you know, download it back because it's just a computational, um, computational issue. Um, I, I've also seen arguments on the other side that, you know, it, and somewhat philosophical that uh, it's very, very difficult to create something that is going to be is going to be better or more, more capable than you. So it becomes a question of more of a philosophy at that. There's a, okay, you know what? I will figure this out at one point. We already have discussions about whether or not the self-driving car, we've seen, we've seen those types of the questions about what about uh, the question self-driving car makes. It was a really great point that was made that a sticker on a stop sign can actually thwart that at the moment. We have, if anybody's seen the Boston Dynamics videos, awesome videos. This is Atlas and Mini Dog. Uh, they ref recently just did a thing where they took Atlas out and he ran through a park, jumped over a log, and it was kind of cool, all autonomously. How do we take something where we get to where we trust those without turning it into this or this? Um, that's always been the big question is when do we turn the decision making over to the machines? When do the machines decide to take over decision making of their own? Um, there's, there's a lot of interesting research I know that's going on in the AI space, but the, really the question then becomes, um, going back to almost Asimov's three rules of robotics, how do we w interact with these? How do we, how do we gate what these machines are able to do? How do we gate what we're, what we're able to do with them in the, in the purpose of human augmentation in such a way that we're able to defend against this type of thing and yet at the same time still enjoy the benefits of it. I would submit that it's really a question of trust or if you don't like the trust, it's a question of risk. Trust and risk are really the flip sides of the same coin. We're not really good at managing risk in the cybersecurity arena yet. We talk about it a lot. We've got customers that demand it. We've got the risk management framework that's got risk in the title. It must be great. But we don't manage to risk. We're managing to some sort of zero-based concept that we have. And yet, in our daily lives, we manage to risk all the time. The, earlier this morning, we heard, you know, I lock my car. Why do I lock my car? Because there's a risk associated with it. I take a look at it. And just right now, inherently, I'm making the decision, yeah, it makes more sense to lock my car because I'm not willing to take the risk. We do the same thing when we walk down the street. We walk down the street. You're looking at traffic coming by. You come up on a red light. Um, you kind of look at traffic on either side to see if you can go. It's a risk calculation. We do it in every other area of it. And yet we punt on it so far in cybersecurity. Not necessarily as professionals. We all believe in it. But getting it adopted and understood as a concept of level of acceptable risk. I really like the point that was made earlier this morning by Mr. English. We're talking about how we can't trust these underlying machines. We need to reintroduce the concept of skepticism. Part of the reason that the information operations um, worked with, with uh, Russia in, the, in 2016, part of the reason that that worked was because we tend to, as a society, believe everything that comes out of that box. If we saw it, it must be true, especially if it lines up with what we want to believe is true in the first place. So we don't really have this concept yet of, of 
risk-based decision making when it comes to this point. And that's something that I, th I believe is a real, a real key to getting to a future where we're able to use autonomous systems and, and AI systems, particularly where they interact. We're going to have to demonstrate that they have a, tr they have a level of trust or a level of acceptable risk that we're willing to tolerate. And then, by the way, tolerate it. Um, I've seen, matter of fact, I would ask, how many people out there have customers or have organizations that they're in that have this concept of, yeah, we, we've got a level of acceptable risk and then want to shoot the messenger anytime something goes wrong? I've got one hand in the back, which means I've got a lot of people in denial. Um, and that's okay. Um, I've been in denial for a long time. Um, so that's one of the things that we're trying to address. One of the things we're trying to address in Lockheed is actually how do you get to a level of risk or a level of trust that says, you know what, the decision the machine's going to make on this is no worse than the average human being is going to make, given the same data. I mean, realistically, we want to try and drive it to zero, but how many times have we made the right, right risk decision or how many times have we made a wrong risk decision and then had to figure out how to re return from that? That's what resiliency and robustness is all about. How intelligent will machines get? Well, anybody know what, when this took place? This is Kasparov and Deep Blue. This is their second match. 1997, 22 years ago this year. Deep Blue actually defeated Garry Kasparov. Um, heard a great, great talk by Garry Kasparov. He was talking about the fact that one of the things that was kind of interesting is his, his legal team actually negotiated to where they would get a record of all the games that Deep Blue played in competition for him to review before going into his competition. The sum total of those games was zero. It never played a competition game, which denied him information he could use about learning how Deep Blue actually, how its algorithms worked. However, Deep Blue basically destroyed him in that, in that series. Um, that was 22 years ago. Fast forward 20 years, we have AlphaGo. Go is a much more complex version or complex game than chess. And yet it, we now have AlphaGo defeating in 2017, again, 20 years later, defeating the leading human in Go. 20 years. Now, there were a couple of technology changes and improvements over the course of 20 years. There was a thing called the iPhone that came out. There was a, you know, iPods, things like that. But it, it goes to talk about how we're now starting to look at and how we're trying to train, and we're training machines that are able to do distributed, distributed run distributed algorithms much, much faster and make decisions based on not 100% information in order to get there. So I would, before I get to what Lockheed's doing, so I would, I would speculate, and again, it's speculation, we're gonna run into this in an ever increasing rate. It took 20 years to get to this step. I would, I would submit that it's not a linear kind of growth in, the, in that technology and that learning level. I would say that it's probably more exponential. I don't have a factual basis for that or a statistical one. Those are not necessarily the same. But I do have a belief that given the other patterns I've seen in technology growth, that we're gonna to start to see more and more of this work. So what's Lockheed doing? The, well, we spent all last week in a forum gathered together talking about what are the hard problems that we've got coming forward. So it actually, this became a very timely, uh, timely discussion. We're looking at an integrated battlefield. We're looking at the fact that we've got sensors everywhere, whether it be airborne, whether it be spaceborne, whether it be, um, whether it be just a programmable logic controller node somewhere sitting there. We have ground systems, we have missile systems. All these things talk, but not necessarily to each other. That is still a big capability gap that exists across the industry today. Now, there are some translation things. We're seeing a lot of movement across all of the defense industry um, in trying to bring those types of things together. But there are, there's a very basic con concept of if these things are going to communicate to each other first, we need to actually make them communicate with each other. I mean, be able to listen to each other and talk to each other. Secondly, we're trying to take the, the data that we're getting from all of this that we're able to turn into individual pieces of information and say, okay, can we create a global situational awareness, not for each of those machines that are sitting out here, but can we create it in such a way that they can create a, a mission unique situational awareness? If I've got a missile system sitting 
you know, on the ground out here somewhere, missile defense system, it may not necessarily care if it's sitting in, say, Japan, it may not necessarily care what's going on in Europe. It may not be relevant to it. But there may be aspects that would be relevant, I'm not sure what, and it would need to have access to be able to get that information as it, as it needs it on demand. We also need that in the sense that for this to work, we're going to have to push processing to the edge. Processing requirements are going to become much, much more difficult. One of the estimations that we have is at a minimum it will be a teraflop per watt. Current processor technologies out there, if you're looking at high, really, really high performance processors, are about a tenth of that right now, a teraflop per watt. So think 45 watts, 44 watts, you're looking at 44 teraflops of processing. Um, I'm sorry, teraflop per watt per second. Um, you get to that kind of that kind of level of processing. You've got is going to take a hardware a hardware change, but it needs to be focused to how do we start to integrate the systems together and get them to talk and understand each other, and then how do we get them to do their own cognitive decision making at, at those points? How do we get them to under, understand the environment that they're living in themselves, and understand from there how to how to trust the machines around them and what level of trust that is because it's also probably not going to be 100 percent some of the other things that we that we've been doing and ooh, getting cl a little close on time um, okay I, I have to talk about this and this is alpha pilot alpha pilot is one of the fun things that Lockheed gets to do unlike our new space sent cologne if anybody saw that on April 1st okay nobody did if you get a chance to use the Wayback Machine, go back to April 1st, read our space systems company. Space company came out with a, a new cologne that smelled like space. Um, it was this new, this new joint venture that we were getting into. Um, and it was April Fool's Day. They did make some samples, though. I'm trying to get my hands on it. Um, Alpha Pilot. Lockheed Martin has joined, joined up with uh, NVIDIA and uh, the Drone Racing League to create an autonomous drone race where uh, I forget how many teams were chosen. We're in the third, I think, third round of down selects for that for the year. There'll be a race at the end of the year, autonomous race. The machine, the drone itself, will learn about the course as it flies it and will compete against other drones that are learning it. And each of the teams has different algorithms. They all get the same equipment. It's this equipment right here. They get the exact same equipment, exact same platform. It's an NVIDIA, um, oh, shoot, I think it's a Xavier uh, platform that they'll be using for, you know, for their programming uh, purposes. But that's, that's going to ha happen later this year. There's a $1 million prize to the winning, to the winning racer um, or race team. And uh, the first autonomous, the very first autonomous drone that defeats a human pilot in a drone race actually gets another quarter of a million dollar bonus. So it'll be something interesting. The Drone Racing League is going to be televising it. I believe that's on like the fifth or sixth or eighth ESPN channel that's out there, but um, if you look at Lockheed's website, we'll probably have some sort of announcement about it. This is actually an older technology. This is called the Mule. Mule is designed to follow around combat troops and carry their bags for them. This is autonomous. It's designed to actually focus in with them, and they load it up, and it follows them around as they go. It's not necessarily pre-programmed with any particular route. It's just an autonomous vehicle that's designed to help them with that um, this is one of our new, one of our newer launches. It's one of the uh, Sikorsky had been working on for a while. They sh actually showed uh, an, a helicopter drone land on a um, identify and land on a cargo ship. Um, it actually was a I forget what what it was, but a cargo ship out in a river. From there, they've actually now developed an, a truly unmanned uh, aircraft, unmanned helicopter, and they've started working with unmanned unmanned teaming with different purposes. So I've got a helicopter and I've got a drone. And those two are able to communicate with each other and are able to do conduct missions together and then go off and separately and then come back together. Um, it's a very fascinating time. It's part of one of the things that we've been looking at in addition to manned, uh, manned unmanned collaboration. Unmanned unmanned collaboration of different types. And this is actually one of the, it gets to my unmanned unmanned collaboration as well. The ability for for drones to be unmanned, um, unmanned wingmen for pilots. Take the number of pilots down that we have in the air that are at risk 
and actually bring in drones that can actually work with them to achieve different types of missions and have different types of drones that are able to assimilate different types of missions as they come through dynamically. So with that, I think I've given us about, what, five minutes or ten minutes for questions? I've lost Joel. So I'll end with a picture. That's my favorite airplane. Um, I'll end with that. I'll take any questions that you might have. We have about ten minutes. Ten minutes? Perfect. So it answered all your questions about what Lockheed is doing in this AI space. That's perfect. Yes, sir. I'm starting to read a, a little bit now about Army Futures Command and their experimentation with multi-domain um, operations. Yep. And so, uh, you know, for example, an artillery battalion on land can now see a ship that's 10 miles offshore. And that, 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 that goes into your point about that uh, uh, multi, um, is multi-domain integration. But will it, uh, I mean, will it get to the point where the operator at the artillery at, in the artillery piece or the artillery missile just can't, um, just can't handle all of the information they're seeing? That, it's a great question, and it's one of the ones that we brought up as part of the hard problems, and that gets back to that mission unique or mission, uh, mission specific uh, situational awareness that we're looking at. One of the problems with multi-domain operations, among many of the problems with multi-domain operations is, how do you keep from flooding the human with too much data? Um, how do you provide them information that is a, what they need, but also with an understanding of what, um, with what their options are to a certain, to a certain point. Um, we've got actually several different groups that are working on that. We have a large focus on that common operating pr picture, frankly, just to see what that should look like. How can you make a user find common operating picture that would be, specific, uh, be good for that? Going beyond that, as we get into more of the cognitive architectures, one of the things we're looking at is how do we provide that same operator, not just with that information, but information as to here are recommendations and here's our, here's our, our confidence level in what those recommendations are um, and give them more of that kind of thing. One of, the, one of the things that was brought up was Waze. Waze is really, really good for doing several different things, right? I mean, how many people here are using it actively? I use it because, A, it tells me where police are, where, um, where red light cameras are, um, something that drives my wife nuts. And then I, I use it because if something happens, it'll dynamically reroute me. Well, we need that same capability which already exists. We need that same kind of capability in the, in the defense area to help with the similar, similar kinds of things, of being able to say to that same group, okay, here's the ship, but the ship's actually starting to go to this path, so these options are gonna disappear on you. We now recommend that these recommendations move up with a certain level of confidence in them. Thank you. Can you comment at all on steps that Lockheed is taking to secure the AI part of the autonomous uh, systems? I can to a certain extent. And what I can uh, say is that we're looking into, um, well, number one, we're looking at how, how we go about sharing and how we go about sharing and or not sharing some of the information from the different types of systems. So if you've got, um, um, and I, I Again, I'm not an AI expert, but if you've got neural networks doing one set of processing and you've got machine learning that's been doing another set of learning and those types of things, we're, using, we're now looking at ways that, those, that the training, for example, the training systems can be used to poison the, the training set so that the training set now becomes skewed. We're looking at ways to turn around and uh, validate that or ways to take, it's, it's actually a lot easier in some cases because we know what the we know what the parameters for the operation of a certain system should be. Um, so we know that maybe there's only a certain set of commands or a certain set of traffic that should be going over this type, or over this, um, this data link. And so we're able to profile that much easier and create training sets out of that. So we're doing a lot of those types of things. It is still a very, very big open issue from, especially the training side, the how do you trust that your training data, why, how do you trust that you're not training for the test um, to go ahead and, you know, and, and prove that you're at 90%. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do on it. There's a lot of other activities in, um, in our space systems company in particular, and, um, and uh, I know in our missiles and fire command, our f fire control uh, business area also work, working at that space. We have a lot of, a lot of work on how do we go back and, and uh, bring that in. Now a second question that kind of comes out of that 
is how do we know that we are how do we know that we're actually on the right path of developing things? And so we're doing a lot of really early stage R&D with, um, we've opened up a new AI and machine learning laboratory that's a virtual laboratory extends all the way across Lockheed Martin that's using, um, that's basically being used right now for certain specific R&D projects just to help us learn better what types of techniques are better for which types and not look at trying to solve everything with one type of learning system. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. So this is a question from a very academic standpoint. Is in the academic world, there's a lot of work going on in securing machine learning, securing AI mm -hmm. techniques. How much of this do you see is ready for adoption in your mission-critical systems, and how much do you have to develop uh, straight off, off uh, from scratch? That is a great question. Um, that's one of the bigger, biggest challenges we run into. And, we, and frankly, we don't just run into it with university research. We also run into it with uh, laboratory research. Um, with some of the national labs. A lot of the research that we get will take things to a level which works in a certain isolated type of environment but hasn't been used or spread out to the kind of size, uh, um, extended to the type of size or the types of complexity that we run into. And so there generally is a lot of, uh, even if we've got notional use cases that we use when we're working collaborative projects with the, with the universities, we're finding that it requires an awful lot of additional research after that fact internally to adapt it to a larger, much larger system. The principles are generally very, very sound. It's the how do we apply them to disparate weapon systems that frankly have been developed under, under way different uh, parameters. A lot of it is, a lot of it going forward is looking pretty good because we're able to kind of, kind of normalize and take some of that and go forward very nicely. But we've got an awful lot of equipment out there to retrofit as well. Um, matter of fact, you go back to some of, the, some of the stuff that we have in, in space has been around for decades. Um, and so we, we've got some issues there. But it does take an awful lot. Uh, generally, I don't know, I would, I would almost look at, Derek is here keeping me honest. Um, I would almost say we've, it's at least a two year effort for us to take something and, then, uh, and that's a fast track if we're able to speed it. Now part of that's speed of Lockheed too. Um, but thank you. Are there any other questions or? Comments? Why is that your favorite plane? Why is that my favorite plane? Um, there's a lot of reasons for, for that. Um, part of it was when I was when I was stationed at Castle, they were just uh, they were they were just decommissioning the the SR-71s, and we had one come in on uh, to come in for static display. And I'd always read about them, and then seeing that thing in flight was just amazing. Um, now, that's not to say that I don't like a lot of our other airplanes that are created both by Lockheed, by Boeing, Northrop. I mean, there's, there's a lot of ones out there, but this has been my favorite. Um, and the fact that we were, in, we were a KC-135 base, and KC-135 held the, the, land, the speed record, uh, Los Angeles to DC, or Los Angeles to New York, um, until the SR-71 broke it. And it had been like two hours and 17 minutes. The SR-71 did it in 68 minutes, the same, the same route. So. Um, nice airplane. If you ever get a chance to see it out in D.C., there's uh, at the Udvar Hazy. Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Rob. So before we all break, because we will have a 15-minute break now here, uh, I want any student in the room who is looking for a job for this summer or next summer, meaning career or internship, to raise your hand. Raise it high. Okay, those of you who keep saying we're looking to hire your students, look around the room. See those with their hands up? They are potential new hires for you. Okay, now, students, put your hands down. Anybody in the room who is with a commercial government agency or any type of organization other than a university, if your organization is looking to hire uh, cyber security, cyber physical systems uh, students uh, or new hires, please raise your hand. All right, students, now put a beeline to those people during this break. Very good. Okay, we'll reconvene in 15 minutes for the next panel.